Good afternoon, fabulous people. Uh, welcome to another edition of the uh, wonderful Board of Education for Metro Nashville Public Schools meeting. And we are so glad and honored that you are here. Um, we have a quorum, and I will ask a special guest in the audience tonight, Mr. Mike Evett from uh, Hamilton County. He's the chair of the Hamilton County Board of Education. If you will come and lead us in the pledge, I would appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I wasn't expecting this. The right hand pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Around here, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll start with announcements. Uh, Dr. Brandon, we'll start with you. Ms. Spearing? Yes, thank you. Uh, we know that many of our students uh, suffer from stress due to teaching to the test and over testing. And I'm hopeful that one day we'll be able to reduce the teaching to the test and also the number of tests that we're giving, given. Uh, but in the meantime, an, an organization, a nonprofit organization by the name of Inward Bound Mindful Education, uh, offers retreats across the country for teenagers, parents, and professionals. And some are scheduled for Thompson Station here in Nashville on September the 26th through the 28th for teenagers. Uh, there are many benefits to this training, but one is to learn how to deal with difficult emotions. So for more information, uh, you can Google <clears throat> Inward Bound Mindful Education. Teaching and Learning Committee will meet on Thursday, the 31st of July from 4 to 6. And at this time, we're going to hear about our strengths and our weaknesses uh, as revealed from our achievement test. And, uh, and ways that administration uh, is thinking, ways that we can improve our, our teaching and learning. Uh, we will also have an update from Human Capital uh, on the recruitment of our high quality teachers. And we will have a presentation uh, about teacher compensation study uh, where we're comparing MNPS with other urban districts that have similar characteristics. Also on this agenda are ways, are, are plans of ways to improve teacher morale. Amy Frog is on vacation tonight, but uh, she asked me to announce that uh, July 31st, right before the Teaching and Learning Committee meeting, we're going to have a short governance meeting uh, for, at 3.45 to vote on EE12. That concludes my announcements. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kim? Ms. Shepard. Thank you. Just a couple. Last Saturday, uh, Mayor Carl Dean and um, Representative Dern Jernigan had a ribbon cutting ceremony for a brand new park in Old Hickory called Cricket Branch Park. It has a, a mile and a half loop that um, after we did, had the ribbon cutting, we made two laps around the, the loop. It's beautiful back there. It's along the river. So I encourage you to check it out. It's part of the greenways of, of Nashville. It's, it's a really neat little park. Um, also, the Donaldson Hermitage Neighborhood Association on Monday, this coming Monday the 14th, is sponsoring a political forum. Uh, and it will uh, include the candidates for school board as well as the candidates to fill the seat uh, in District 11, which uh, was vacated when Representative Jernigan resigned from that seat. And uh, one more, I know Amy's not here tonight, but I just wanted to give her a shout out for um, uh, pressing on with her passion around recess. Uh, if you've seen the news of late, then you've known that we're, we're taking a, a keener look at recess and what it looks like for our children. And um, her laser focus will result in some necessary recess time for our children. So kudos to her. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Pinkston. Thank you. Uh, three things. Uh, first, uh, student achievement data. I approached this topic at our June 24th meeting, but tonight I'd like to go ahead and formally request Ms. Spearing that as part of the upcoming Teaching and Learning Committee meeting that we focus on something that we uh, rarely, rarely talk about, uh, which is uh, student achievement data, where it is and, and where it isn't. Uh, I'm told uh, by the state that district TCAP and end of course data will be available during the last week of July, so uh, that Teaching and Learning Committee might be a good time to take a first pass uh, uh, for the board to uh, examine what this year's results look like. If you're open to that idea. 
Um, also, I want to bring uh, notice of two separate motions I'll bring, I will be bringing at upcoming meetings. Um, the first uh, concerns English learners. Uh, since uh, fall 2002, I've been asking uh, uh, management to articulate a strategy for how we're going to improve our efforts to educate the youngest new Americans. Uh, nearly two years later, we really have not heard an answer. So in the absence of a plan, I think it's incumbent on the board uh, to step in and exert some leadership. Uh, as we know, we oversee one of the most diverse school systems in Tennessee and one of the most diverse in America. Uh, the fact that we haven't spent any time in the boardroom discussing uh, those challenges and opportunities is problematic. So I'll be bringing a motion to launch a board-led initiative that would help establish a strategy and focus public attention on this important issue. Uh, finally, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Chancellor Claudia Bonneman ruled from the bench in the case of SEIU versus the Nashville School Board. We're still waiting on the written order and a briefing from our attorneys, but if, we, what he, what, if what we've heard is correct, then Chancellor Bonneman has said that the board's labor negotiations policy dating back to 2000 uh, remains in effect despite uh, efforts to unilaterally discard it uh, with that board approval. So absent the ability to have an open conversation, I intend to bring a motion that would require management to abide by the policy that Chancellor Bonneman has now said twice remains in effect. Uh, I think it's kind of time to cut our losses and chart a path toward more collaborative labor relations. Uh, this has been a distraction for a couple of years now, and I look forward to having an open conversation at an upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinkston. And I will also, um, I just have a few announcements, and we'll start here. July 18th, we will hold the Social, Social Emotional Learning Conference at Cambridge High School. It starts at 8, 8 a.m., um, and I'm pretty excited about being there to uh, do the welcome there. So um, we'll see how that goes. Also, July 23rd at 11.30 a.m., uh, the groundbreaking ceremony for the new elementary school on Smith Springs Road will take place. Um, if you are planning to attend, please note that the parking will be available at Camp Wigewagon and there will be shuttles to take us to the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, also, I had all this written down and I don't know what I did with it. Tonight, starting at, uh, I believe it's at 6 either 6 or 6.30, it is the Crossings National Nashville Action Partnership meeting that will be held at the Cross, or, I'm sorry, it said Asurion tonight. I believe that starts at 6.30. Um, so I think that's all of the announcements that I have. And if I've missed any, I do sincerely apologize because I don't have my information in front of me. Uh, we will now move on to awards and recognitions, recognition of new school leaders. Madam sorry. Chair, I'll... Uh, Uh, to come up and introduce uh, new leaders. Fred has a short list and Jay has a longer list. Uh, and as we announce these, we'd ask our leaders to come up to the front so that you can, uh, uh, so that the board can see you and so that we can recognize you. Jay just gave me my script. <laughs> <laughs> With the start of the new fiscal year, we have the opportunity to welcome employees into new assignments. Tonight, we are going to introduce employees who have been promoted into new positions who, or who have significantly changed duties. We're fortunate so many are able to join us so board members can put names to faces of our new leaders. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ms. Taffy Marsh as our new Director of Transportation. If Taffy would come up. Um, I think the board is aware that uh, very early in the year I asked Taffy to serve as a consultant um, to transportation in addition to her duties as uh, director of central services and um, he has has gotten in with both hands both feet and everything else uh, to really get our transportation department on track and running smoothly and I want to make her appointment permanent. She now joins only four other female directors of transportation in the Council of Great City Schools. Right. Awesome. Right. I want to call a few more people up from Leadership and Learning and then we'll do a group picture 
with Dr. Register and Cheryl of the district office employees. Then we'll call the new principals up and then we'll call the pre-K team up. So I'm pleased to announce tonight the restructuring of leadership and learning. Uh, we have three uh, doctors that will be leading elementary, middle, and high school. Dr. Vanessa Garcia has been an executive lead principal for elementary for the past year. She's a former teacher here in Metro Schools and a former administrator principal from Williamson County. Uh, she's also a professor, uh, adjunct professor at Trevecca and at uh, Lipscomb University. So Dr. Vanessa Garcia, uh, executive officer for elementary schools if you'll come forward <laughs> Dr. Antoinette Williams has been a longtime employee of Metro Schools. She is one of the um, principals for middle schools, and she was recently promoted to, an exec uh, to a lead principal and then to the executive officer for middle preps. Dr. Antoinette is a former math teacher and also um, worked in the broadcasting field before coming into uh, education. So Dr. Antoinette Williams, the new executive officer for the middle preps. Dr. Michelle Wilcox, the new executive officer for high schools, is a um, longtime education employee with a uh, background in special education and dropout prevention and also working at the college and university level, high school and middle school. So these three ladies have a wealth of experience spanning pre-K. <laughs> So in the restructuring and in working toward K-12 alignment, um, I have promoted Kelly, Dr. Ke soon to be Dr. Kelly Henderson in about uh, two more weeks, um, to the Executive Director of Instruction, Pre-K-12. Um, that will afford us the opportunity to align our curriculum, to align our assessments, to align everything that we're working on um, in uh, instruction and curriculum. So Dr. soon to be Dr. Kelly Henderson. <laughs> Dr. Sharon Cheney. We have Matt Nelson, who comes to us from uh, the Shelby Memphis School District. He has been with us for a year as the coordinator for advanced academics. Um, Matt has a, a background in AP and IB and will take over as the director of advanced academics. person at the district office. We are proud to welcome back Dr. Shun Turner. Uh, Dr. Shun Turner is the former principal of Martin Luther King Magnet School and then left for a year um, to work at Lead Charter School and has come back as the coordinator of Gifted Services. Our next group are new principals, and I am proud of this group of principals. Um, I think that they'll do great work here in Metro Schools, and I think you'll be proud of their accomplishments. The first one uh, coming to us from Williamson County uh, is Jay Adams, the new principal at Hattie Cotton STEM Magnet Elementary School. Dr. Aaron Anderson, coming from Overton High School, will be the new principal of Wright Middle Prep. Dr. Craig Hammond, coming to us from Hillsborough High School, will be the new principal of West End Middle Prep. Miriam Harrington, coming to us from Hunters Lane High School, will be the new principal of Jerry Baxter Middle Prep. Mr. Darren Kennedy, coming from Whites Creek High School, will be the new principal of McKissick Middle Prep. Mm -hmm. 
Ms. Trelawney Lane, coming to us from JFK Middle Prep, will be the new principal of Robert Churchwell Museum Magnet Elementary. All right, our next principal, um, one of a father and son team, uh, Dr. Darwin Mason Jr. Senior was on the list, but he just walked in the door, so I'll give you a <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Uh, Darwin Mason Jr. coming to us also from Williamson County, Maxwell Elementary School's new principal. Also returning to the district, Dr. Darwin Mason Sr. will be the new principal at Cole Elementary School. coming from Overton High School will be Dr. Jill Pittman, the new principal of Goodlettsville Middle Prep. <laughs> Moving up from assistant principal at Margaret Allen Middle School will be Keisha Stinson-Cox, the new principal at Margaret Allen Middle Prep. And our final uh, new principal is Mr. Justin Uppinghouse. He is coming to us from Champaign, Illinois, and he is the, from Wits, um, he is the new principal of Witsit Elementary School. All right, we're on again. We do have a father-son team and a mother-daughter team in the district now. Thank you and welcome to the new positions. We look forward to great things from all of you. Our next group is our, our new pre-K team. Uh, Phyllis Phillips has been promoted from coordinator to pre-kindergarten director. The Wilshire has been promoted um, uh, <laughs> to pre-kindergarten innovation director. <laughs> Our three new model center directors from um, Laura Bilbury, who is the new pre-K director at Ross Early Learning Center. <laughs> the pre-K director at Bordeaux Early, Early Learning Center. And Ms. Joanna Guerrero, the Pre-K Director at Casa Azafan Early Learning Center. We should just stay up here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen on the board, I am here with good news that the Washington Post is correcting what was obviously a huge error. Uh, when they, they have recently released revised data that ranks Hillsborough High School as the fourth most academically challenging high school in Tennessee. That, yes, that gives Metro Nashville Public Schools three of the top four spots in this prestigious list. Um, Hume Fogg is the first, MLK is the second. Uh, uh, and, and Hillsboro is the fourth. We now have more schools on the top 10 than any other district in Tennessee. And as a reminder, uh, 
Hillsborough High School is a zoned Academies of Nashville High School that is the culmination of a K-12 International Baccalaureate Continuum. So here to accept this recognition on behalf of the Hillsborough High School and the Borough Nation is Hillsborough High School's Executive Principal, Dr. Terry Schrader. That's a pretty cool honor when you consider there are 138 counties in the state of Tennessee, and for Nashville to have four or three of the four top in the, in the top ten, that's that's pretty impressive. So, good job, good job. Uh, thank you so much. We will move into public participation. Uh, first up is Kurt Kozak, Teacher Issues. Mr. Kozak. And just as a reminder, while Mr. Kozak is getting ready, uh, the board will hear from those persons who have requested to appear at this board meeting. In the interest of time, speakers are requested to limit remarks to three minutes or less. Comments will be timed. Mr. Kozak. Thank you very much. Last month, I was here to introduce to you a group of teachers and other concerned citizens, voters, called Not Bad Teachers. We believe that if our society follows these six tenets in the middle of your page here, 149 words that we can dramatically improve our public education in Tennessee. These are just common sense tenets. Now, the problem with these is they are going to take courageous, informed leaders, and they will require a change in how we educate our youth. Now last month I talked about tenets three, four, and five, about how Not Bad Teachers thinks that we need to get educational and political leaders more involved in the educational process. Specifically, what happens in the classroom. We think there is a disconnect between our leaders and what happens in the classroom. I am thrilled tonight to say that there are two there are at least two courageous leaders in Nashville. There's an incumbent on the board um, right now who has agreed to substitute teach three days next year if elected. There is a challenger who has agreed to uh, substitute three days a year next year. We are just thrilled that this is happening and we think that these two uh, board members will serve as an example to others. We believe that there's a high positive correlation between school board understanding and involvement in the classroom and academic achievement. Now, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about tenant one of our tenants here. Tenant one says, no one will force, either directly or indirectly, a teacher to pass a student who has not learned the material in that class. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I mention this to my friends in the business world, and they look at me like, that's just common sense. It is. We believe it is. Hopefully, what I describe tonight to you will not be a surprise. If it is a surprise, please get out in the classrooms. Call your teachers in your district in confidence and see what's going on in the classroom. What happens in, in a lot of metro um, high schools is teachers are under great pressure to pass students. Great pressure. We have a, a failure rate. It used to be 10%. It's not stated now, but if your failure rate's above 20, 25%, you may not be coming back next year as a teacher. So we are under incredible um, pressure to pass students who may not know the material. Please look at Ms. Mr. Alpha and Ms. Bravo on the attached sheet. Mr. Alpha's real grade in one of my Algebra II classes was a 40.5%. I passed him with a 70 because to get my failure rate within acceptable limits. My failure rate used to be about 20%. Mr. Bra Ms. Bravo is the same way on the back. Last comment, How do you, do you think these kids knew Algebra II? 
And how do you think they did on the ACT? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Kozak. Uh, Steve Ball. Good evening, members of the board. I stand with you, uh, stand before you tonight with a couple of friends behind me. Um, we, the principals and instructional leaders of Metro Nashville Public Schools, would like to offer you this letter of support for the leadership and vision of Dr. Jesse Register, Director of Schools. During his tenure, time and again, Dr. Register has demonstrated a commitment to ensuring that all students are provided with the foundation of knowledge, skills, and character necessary to excel in higher education, work, and life. His willingness to make the tough and sometimes unpopular decisions, his intentional focus on instructional efficacy and excellence, and his pledge to look closely at our own practices so we can find ways to improve, mean that MNPS students, families, employees, and community members have a vocal educational advocate in Dr. Register. We are his direct reports, his colleagues, his collaborators, and his supporters who are duty bound with him to educate this city's and this nation's future citizens. At present, MNPS is placed in the state's second highest accountability category, a far cry from the district that was in state takeover upon Dr. Register's arrival. He collaborated with district and community leaders along with parents and advocates to design a more equitable school system that emphasizes the interconnectedness of teacher effectiveness, central office support, positive teacher-student interactions, accountability at all levels, and school-based autonomy and guaranteeing student academic achievement and social-emotional development. Dr. Register relied upon those with institutional history to help him make informed decisions about how to best respect and preserve the district's traditions while moving forward with needed transformational change. Some of the district's accomplishments under Dr. Register's leadership include being one of the first school systems in the nation to be awarded Race to the Top federal funds, achieving national recognition for its blended learning practices and district-wide technology in the classroom implementation, expanding a high-quality early childhood program so that more children have pre-K experiences, continuing to develop the academies of Nashville as students' needs evolve, introducing the middle preps of Nashville as the starting point to career and or college readiness, providing no-cost healthy meals for all students regardless of family socioeconomics, and partnering with other urban districts to investigate the correlation between discipline disparity and student achievement and performance. To date, there have been over 1,000 visitors to our district, including, as you know, President Barack Obama and Secretary of Education Arne Duncan, to witness our teachers' hard work and dedication under Dr. Register's leadership. The district continues to gain and grow. Finally, Dr. Register has challenged principals and instructional leaders to lead, and we have done just that. He has given us more autonomy through a redesigned leadership paradigm that distributes leadership and decision making among a greater number of people. He has streamlined central office operations so that resources and support are in our schools where the needs are the greatest. He has trusted us to make decisions that are best for our schools, our students, and our teachers. In short, Dr. Register has created a professional teaching, learning, and leading environment in which all members are valued, for their individual contributions to the district's vision and mission. He has empowered us, which in turn allows us to empower those we lead. We are the principals and instructional leaders of MNPS, leading approximately 83,000 students and 5,100 teachers in the nation's 42nd largest school district. Our teachers and students represent the African and Asian diasporas, the cities and villages of Central and South America, and of course, Music City. We have a diversity of languages and experiences that enrich our already dynamic district. We are the clusters of Antioch, Cane Ridge, Glencliff, Hillsboro, Hillwood, Hunters Lane, McGavick, Maplewood, Overton, Pearl Cone, Stratford, and Whites Creek. And we stand here tonight proudly supporting Dr. Jesse Register as he continues to work for the students, families, employees, and community members of Greater Nashville. And this letter is signed by over 200 principals and instructional leaders in the system. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much.
glad I came tonight. Um, we will move on to uh, governance issues. Uh, consent agenda, Ms. Shepard. Consent agenda 1A, approval of minutes 527-14 special meeting. B, recommend approval of change order number 2 for Joelton Middle School. Southland Construction, Constructors LLC. C. Recommend approval of change order number one for Paragon Mills Elementary School, HVAC Renovations, Anderson Piping Company, Inc. D. Recommend approval of change order number one for Kirkpatrick Elementary HVAC Renovations, Advanced Mechanical Constructors, Inc. Contractors, Inc. E. Recommend approval of change order number one for White, White's Creek High School Boiler Replacement, Advanced Mechanical Contractors, Inc. F. Recommend approval of request number six for district-wide maintenance, repairs, and general construction, demolition of houses at Smith Springs Road for the new Antioch Cluster Elementary School, Carrie G. Campbell, Inc. G. Recommend approval of request number seven for district-wide maintenance, repairs, and general construction, security vestibule at Two Rivers Middle School, Carrie G. Campbell, Inc. H, recommend approval of request number 11 for district-wide maintenance, repairs, and general construction renovations at Casa Azafran Pre-K Center, Southland Constructors, LLC. I, recommend approval of request number 12 for district-wide maintenance, repairs, and general construction, library renovations at Apollo and DuPont Tyler Middle Schools, Southland Constructors, LLC. J, recommend approval of request number one for demolition and repairs of Glencliff High School Stadium bleachers, the Gordian Group. K, recommend approval of request number two for John Early Middle School renovations, administration area, the Gordian Group, Inc. L, revision of lease agreement for Cameron College Prep Charter Schools use of the Cameron School building. M, revision of lease agreement for Lead Academy Charter Schools use of the Brookmead building. N, awarding of purchases and contracts. One, DAC Paving Company, Inc., three requisitions. Two, Dell Marketing LP, four requisitions. Three, Gartner, Inc., four, Imagine Learning, two requisitions. Five, Institutional Wholesale Company. Six, Lightning Towing and Recovering. Seven, Music and Arts. Eight, Noser Cons Consulting, LLC. Nine, Perry Pole, Inc., ten, Seacoast Center for Education, 11, Southland Regional Education Board, Southern Regional Edu Educational Board, 12, Taylor Music, Inc., 13, Tennessee Higher Education Commission Grant, 14, Vanderbilt Susan Gray School, 15, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, 16, Washington Music, and O, recommend approval of request for compulsory attendance waiver. Madam Chair, I would recommend that we approve the ag consent agenda as read. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, now we will move into our next uh, item on the agenda, the recommended approval of revisions to policies. Um, we have recommended approval of revisions of E3 personnel development, EE5 staff compensation, EE10 communication and counsel to the board, GP2 governing style, GP7 committee structure, and EE3, Treatment of Parents, Students, and Citizens. Is there a, a motion for approval? Madam Chair, I, accept, I move that we accept the revisions as presented. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next on the agenda, we will have the recommended removal of EE14 district calendar. Yay. Um, is <laughs> there's a slight yay? <laughs> Is there a motion for approval? I move that we approve. Second. Any uh, discussion? I thought not. No, yeah. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion passes. <coughs> and now we will move on to approval of zoning for the new elementary school on Smith Springs Road. Dr. Register. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'll ask Chris Weber to come up to the podium, please. Uh, to do a very brief presentation. Um, we did have a meeting on uh, July 2nd at Lakeview Elementary School attended by uh, 100 people uh, as a final public hearing uh, on the approval of the zoning for the new elementary school. Uh, Chris will present the recommendation to you. Madam Chair, I appreciate your attendance at that meeting and uh, uh, we are ready to recommend approval of this zone uh, 
for the new elementary school. I'll ask Chris to do a very brief presentation. Dr. Register, um, uh, what I passed around is the packet of the proposal that we're asking for you to approve tonight for the rezoning for the new school that will open on Smith Springs Road in 2015. Um, last week we had a meeting there, a community meeting, so this is an update as requested by the board to have an additional meeting. There was about 100 people present at that meeting. Um, the mixture was well attended by parents and affected teachers in that relevant community there. And the questions were, were good questions, mostly parents that were asking questions specific to where they lived in the boundary, transportation questions, grandfathering questions. Um, and with that, uh, I'll be happy to answer any specific questions you have. Any questions from board members? Second. Whoa, boy, we're on top of this thing tonight. All right, is there a motion for approval? So move. <laughs> oh, is that tonight? So there's a motion for approval. It's been properly second. Any further discussion? All right. All in favor say, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Pinkston. Um, I'm going to vote for these lines. Obviously, this new school is going to be at the eastern end of my district, and I hope it's going to be a good school. Um, we haven't heard much about the academic program yet, but maybe we'll get a chance to hear more about that this summer and fall. Uh, but I would be remiss on behalf of my constituents if I didn't take a minute and restate my concerns about the deficiencies in front-end public engagement uh, in this situation with voters, parents, students, and taxpayers. There have been uh, a grand total of two community meetings on these zone lines, including one less than a week ago. Attendance at the first meeting was anemic. Attendance at the second meeting was better. But overall, communications has not been adequate. Uh, we changing. Here's why. Call us for more information. Uh, holding a community meeting uh, is one thing, but communicating directly with affected families about something that impacts their lives is something di very different. That just didn't happen. Uh, so I've had several constituents tell me that the process looked like it was deliberately designed to do the bare minimum. Uh, I agree, and the whole approach is contrary to the spirit of EE3, which we just revised a minute ago, which tells the director to involve parents, students, and citizens in important in issues that impact them directly. Um, the reality is we know who these families are, where they live. There's no reason why we shouldn't have been communicating with them directly with letters or robocalls to explain explicitly what's happening versus just holding these ad hoc meetings and doing uh, the minimum. So my prediction now is that later this year when some families start realize that, uh, realizing that they're getting zoned out of their Lakeview and Edison school communities, my voicemail and email is going to start blowing up along with the District 6 representative and we'll be stuck cleaning up uh, a problem, a communications problem, instead of, instead of celebrating a new school. And um, I'm sensitive to this because I spent the equivalent of a month last year dealing with angry constituents about this school because no one from this office bothered telling them that we're going to build a new school in their neighborhood. Uh, not involving citizens in these issues that impact them directly was a failure then. Not communicating directly with affected families about zone lines is a failure now. This is not Mr. Weber's issue. I think this is a board issue. Um, that we need to address, and I think th this experience and the misfire on the Hillsboro cluster rezoning suggests that maybe public engagement on school zoning might be the first order of business as we think through uh, our comprehensive public engagement initiative in the future. We can do a lot better. It's frankly not that hard. And uh, and uh, so before we move on, let me just ask the question directly to Dr. Register: Why did we not send letters? and other notices directly to the affected families as soon as we began rethinking this. We had a number of communications that were put out through the principal's uh, public public uh, participation at the school level for the primarily the two schools that were affected um, uh, in, in the area uh, and uh, will communicate directly with parents uh, once you approve the zone lines. Uh, we always communicate directly with every parent individually about school assignments. That's a, a year in advance. Uh, we feel like we adequately communicated with people in the community. Uh, our continuous feedback from the principals in the area was that parents were asking questions and looking at maps that were available. There was very little controversy, uh, uh, almost none, uh, that we heard about these zones. Uh, so we feel like we adequately communicated. 
And uh, as we go forward, uh, and as we've had quite a bit of experience with rezoning and zoning in this district, we will communicate with every parent individually uh, uh, when uh, official lines are set. Uh, and will uh, and and by approving this at this point in time, a year in advance of the uh, uh, zone, uh, we'll have plenty of time for parents to adequately make choices in the choice program that begins this fall, uh, and to uh, uh, answer and to have answered any questions about transportation that may exist. Since sending a notice that hey, there's a community meeting to discuss a new school is one thing, but sending a letter to an affected family saying you know there was a lot more communication than that mr pinkston i i didn't see it and a lot of my constituents didn't but sending a letter directly to a family saying you know dear joneses your school zone is is possibly changing here's why here's what you can do to call and get more information about it that didn't happen and I, I, let me just say too because i will go to the other extreme with you mr pinkston because a lot of the students that are affected by this new school are actually in district six they're coming from lakeview and thomas edison I have had comments from several uh, parents, several constituents in the areas who are excited about this new school. Um, and it may be, you may not have had, or you know, the contact that you've had may have been at the other extreme because these are people um, or families who will be moving into that area from District 7. But from my perspective, I have had a lot of contact with a lot of parents who are very excited about this. I think the biggest hurdle that we saw in this entire process was the land acquisition. That, and I agree with you 100%, was a major, a major uh, an issue. Um, we've gotten past that. We've gotten to the point where we're about ready to break ground and we're about ready to get the school going. A lot of the parents, again, I'll say, a lot of the parents of the constituents in District 6 have reached out to me. I have provided that information from the district to anybody and have put it on uh, several social media sites. I have sent it out in my monthly email blast to several parents. And so I've not gotten, the other night at the meeting, um, you weren't in, t in attendance, but every one of the people there were very excited about this, this school coming into that community. So I, while I understand what you're saying, I will say to you that I will have to agree with you. I have seen nothing but, I have seen, I have heard a lot of positive feedback on this new school. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of positive feedback and I'm hearing some of it too, but it's, it's a positive for the community uh, out there to have a new school. We should be celebrating a new school and that's a given. But you referenced the land acquisition. I mean, the controversy about the land acquisition didn't start when we made the decision. When the board made the decision, it started months and months and months later when people got wind of it. So there were a lot of people who don't know uh, that this is happening to their families. And I will just kind of redirect and maybe ask, instead of making a criticism, ask a question. In the future with rezonings, Dr. Register, can we not communicate directly with affected families ahead of time? Send a letter drop a robocall, and if, if the answer is no, then why? And I, and I think Dr. Register just said that he would do that. And Dr. Gentry, I'll get to you in just a second. I think we just said that we would do that. Um, so I don't think the issue is not what's happened in the past. The issue is what we do going forward. That's what I just referenced. Yes. So Dr. In Gentry. In spirit, I'd like to call the question so we can move forward with the celebration of the new school. Absolutely. Okay. So any further discussion? That would be a no. All in a pr all, the motion's been made properly second. All, of, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, now we will move into the director's report. Dr. Register. Uh, thank you, Madam thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll call uh, to the podium uh, Lisa Wiltshire, who is director of model schools. We're going to do a uh, quick presentation. Right, Lisa? <laughs> but uh, and, Phil no and Phyllis, uh, Phyllis Phillips is, is coming up to participate also. Uh, we are uh, extremely active and, and so other people are coming up to our new directors I think. I'm not sure who's going to do this presentation but it will be quick. <laughs> okay great. Uh, well we would uh, uh, welcome Lisa to the podium to bring you a brief update on progress that's being made with uh, implementation of the new model pre-case. All right. So I have a PowerPoint that's coming up on the screens in uh, just a minute, and it's something that uh, the board you, you have received earlier. Um, we wanted to just, well, good evening. It's good to be here with you. Um, 
Uh, it's been a little while since we last checked in with you on our pre-K expansion plan, so we wanted to provide you an update as to where we are in the process and how things are going with our new early learning centers. Um, so Phyllis and I will walk you through this uh, uh, brief presentation to give you a sense of, of where we are and how far we've come. Um, and just to start, um, we are uh, on the front end of a multi-year strategic planning process to look at expanding pre-K. Um, this is focused not only on, uh, on growth in terms of increasing the number of seats, high quality pre-K seats available for students in Davidson County, um, but equally important or more important, it's uh, focused on quality and specifically developing uh, model programs that exemplify best practice. Um, this is also focused on, uh, our, our plans are focused on partnerships with Head Start and private providers um, to ensure we have a multiple delivery system model. So this is not the school system saying that we are going to provide uh, universal pre-K by 2018. This is the school system saying we are taking a leadership role and forming a citywide coalition to expand uh, early learning opportunities for families. Um, the first phase or step in this process, as you know, is the establishing, establishing model centers um, that are serving as hubs of innovation so that we can really uh, establish benchmarks for quality. Um, there's a lot of talk about quality and high quality uh, pre-K and early learning, but defining what that means is really important. And that, that is the purpose of, of these model sites. Um, but I think equally important uh, to note is that we are not just focused on the centers. We're focused on all of our pre-K classrooms across the district. And so we're really looking to create some consistent quality in terms of the standards, the programs, and the curriculum. And our centers are not replacing our site-based classrooms. We really want to expand capacity at centers and schools as well as um, our community centers where we have partnerships. Um, so. That's really what we're doing. Um, this is a little bit of the why and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we know that we have uh, uh, just persistent achievement gaps that we need to tackle. And uh, we believe this begins with school readiness gaps. Um, we have a large percentage of economically disadvantaged children and we have an increasing percentage of English learners and children that are new to the country in our district. Um, and so when we talk about school readiness gaps and preparation for kindergarten, uh, you'll see here the circular diagram. We're really focused on five developmental domains when we talk about kindergarten readiness. Um, we're looking at language development and literacy. We're looking at cognitive development, social emotional development, physical development, as well as approaches to learning which is a developmental domain that's unique to our programs that we're developing. And we're really uh, zeroing in on those traits and characteristics that we think are essential for to children to be successful. They include resilience, perseverance, uh, approaches to problem solving. And those are all developmental domains that we are looking at, we're benchmarking, we have metrics within those um, that we're targeting, and our programs and curriculum are all designed to, to address these developmental domains. Um, and this whole plan is not just about that one pre-K year. We're really looking at a continuum. So we want to look at um, successful transitions into kindergarten and beyond, as well as transforming uh, elementary schools. So we're, we're really look, focused on a pre-K to 12 uh, continuum. Um, and research shows us, and we've uh, done, uh, investigated quite a bit of research in the field, um, and for those early learning programs that have achieved long-term benefits uh, for students, they're really defined by four essential components. Um, one is the environment. That's very important in early learning classrooms. Engaging environments, um, excellent teachers, uh, an enriching curriculum and program, and, and as well, strong homeschool connections. And we'll get a little bit into each of those now. Um, 
Uh, in looking at the physical environments of our early learning centers, um, uh, we're really focused on three things. One is we're benchmarking exemplary standards. And so from the beginning, every decision that we're making uh, in terms of developing these centers and transforming the school buildings into centers, um, we're benchmarking standards, um, accreditation standards across the state, national health and safety standards, um, and our, our ultimate goal is we'd like to meet NACI accreditation standards. It's going to take us a while to get there. That's, that's a kind of gold standard in early learning. Um, but we're benchmarking that from the beginning. And those benchmarks are everything from, uh, you know, access to bathrooms and sinks in the classrooms and processes and procedures and how high furniture can be. I mean, it gets very technical and detailed, um, but it's to assure that these environments are developmentally appropriate for children. Um, we're benchmarking best practice um, to make sure that these environments are appropriate for threes, fours, and five-year-olds. We know that many of our buildings, um, the way schools have been designed, are do not have you know, the youngest children in mind. Um, and so we're really transforming these buildings and developing them to, to be best practice. Um, and we really... In, in addition to benchmarking external standards, are focused on our own internal values. Um, so, so when we talk about values for early learning, we really believe that these physical uh, environments need to reflect the children. You, everyone should walk into these buildings, feel welcome, feel nurtured, uh, feel the sense of joy that's there in the learning that's happening with those young children. And so we have a few slides um, that I just wanted to kind of give you a, um, an illustration or an image of what we're talking about because we don't have our classrooms finished yet. We have legions of people working on uh, the classrooms right now, developing them. But the, the picture that you're looking at is a traditional pre-K classroom. And um, it, is, it is organized and it is print rich, but what I want you to notice is um, it is uh, uh, very overwhelming. There are a lot of colors, there's a lot of stimulation. Um, it's busy and a lot of the work, the important student work is at adult eye level and not at student's eye level. So a contrast is this is the kind of environment that we're creating in our model programs. Um, the things that I you know, want you to, to notice in these next few slides are that there are very defined spaces for children to be and work in centers. Um, most of the furniture materials are natural wood. Um, the spaces invite imaginative play, which is how we know children best learn and develop their cognitive thinking. There's lots of natural light. Um, and they are intended to be calm and peaceful and really minimi minimize that anxiety and overstimulation. So we can run through the next few slides and you can get a better sense of, this is a, the one that Phyllis was just on, yeah, that's um, uh, with the children in the classroom engaging with the materials. Um, and you'll notice, this is what you should see when you go into an early learning classroom, is that the children are busy, they're working in centers, Sometimes they're working individually or in pairs and small groups, and the teacher is facilitating the learning throughout the entire classroom by moving through and in the classroom. Um, so you can go on to the next few. This is just another art studio, um, uh, in the, and we're modeling a lot of our center on these pictures, and we can go through the next few. Um, that's just an example of a very good um, uh, reading center in a classroom because part of what's important with these four-year-olds and they're three when they start is this is their first transition into school. So as much replication as we can do of the physical environment to what they would feel at home um, will not only make them feel comfortable but it really fosters the kind of learning that we're trying to implement here. Um, this, this is a, a t you know, typical, maybe traditional elementary classroom with the desks in rows and children are learning math abstractly and this is perfectly appropriate pedagogy for a certain age, but the next slide will show you um, what we're talking about. And uh, this child is learning math concepts through experience. And you learn through experience before you become metacognitive and, and can learn abstractly. And that's really important. And this, uh, that child in that picture is um, uh, learning geometry and spatial relations and quantitative concepts, applied reasoning, the list could go on. But there's a lot of math that happens in the block area. Um, so we, we just wanted to give you a sense of the experiential learning. This next slide, um, 
we are focused as much on the outdoors at these centers um, as on the indoor, in, in the interior of the buildings. Um, we have a, a, a pretty dynamic partnership um, fostering with an organization called Plant the Seed to do community gardens at these centers. And for us, these pictures really exemplify uh, what STEM learning looks like for four-year-olds. They're outside, they're digging in the dirt, they're learning. Um, experimenting constantly and so um, we are assuring that uh, the students have outdoor classrooms as well as indoor at these centers. Um, so uh, the next uh, kind of condition for learning that we're focused on is on our um, staff, our teachers. Um, as you saw earlier, we have hired some dynamic and innovative leaders um, to lead our centers and we'll give them a chance to say hello to you at the end. Um, and one important thing that we know from research is that when we look at those aspects of a teacher that really matter in terms of um, being predictive of student outcomes, tenure is not one, and neither um, are uh, graduate degrees in early childhood education. Interestingly, um, what all of the research we have seen shows is that degrees in child development, so that deep knowledge of child development, as well as certification in pre-K are what really makes a difference. So those are our, our qualifications that we've required of the teachers in our centers. Um, in terms of best practice, we know that teacher support matters more than anything else. And so in our centers, we have an instructional coach that's devoted to uh, professional learning with the teachers. We have um, e educational assistants who serve with the teachers in the classroom. And we are really focusing on a co-teaching model rather than having uh, an assistant in a classroom who just may be doing some crafts in the corner. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about two teachers teaching together. Um, we have a, a full school staffing model so we can meet the needs of students and support teachers. So our centers will have a... Um, a school counselor, speech language pathologist, a special education teacher to support the whole school, uh, and many other staff positions um, that are intended to support the teachers and the students. Um, one thing that we have just recently developed that we're excited about is when we're thinking about how we're going to spread this knowledge and share professional learning, we are going to start this year to have a handful of teachers um, who, who are uh, apprentice model teachers. And so there'll be some classrooms that have two teachers in them, rather than a teacher and an EA, a lead teacher and an apprentice teacher. And what we'd like to do long term is really develop a model where that we can use the centers as sort of a training ground for new teachers who need that support and professional development. And then we want to move those teachers out into other pre-K classrooms in the district. And so we could create over time our own pipeline uh, of teachers and teacher preparation and use these programs to do that. Um, in terms of the, the kind of values underlying what we're doing with the staff, um, we know that children are very well taken care of when the adults are. So we want to make sure that all faculty and staff have access to professional learning opportunities, high quality. And for the programming that we're doing, we are aligning everything we're doing to our curriculum and our five developmental domains. That's very important so we don't end up with a hodgepodge of programs. Um, and they're all intended to build capacity of the teachers over time. So again, it's that teacher support rather than what we continuously hear about the, at, the constant add-on. We're, we're we don't want to overload our teachers. We want them focused on the kids. Um, we have chosen a, um, a curriculum. Uh, for the preschools, and it is uh, Teaching Strategies, the Creative Curriculum for Preschool. Um, there was a lot of work uh, over many months that went into this decision, but we believe that this um, curriculum really meets uh, our benchmark standards. Um, the, the content in the curriculum is really organized around science and social studies big ideas that are very relevant for students. So as opposed to um, some programs that may spend two weeks on one topic uh, like penguins and two weeks on another animal, um, those are fine, but they don't get to the rigor and depth of cognitive thinking that we, we want to see in our classroom. So these are focused around themes that we explore for weeks, such as what makes balls bounce? 
what makes trees grow? And within those big questions that are very relevant for children, um, we interweave an interdisciplinary focus. Um, it's focused on uh, 38 objectives um, that, that look at all developmental domains and content areas. Um, it is aligned to the Tennessee Early Learning Standards, um, which we believe are excellent, and they are aligned to Common Core. Um, and it also includes a, uh, a built-in formative assessment for teachers. So teachers can really kind of track and monitor where each of their students are along these developmental domains. And it encourages the use of student portfolios, which is just uh, uh, collections of student work over time, um, artifacts, observations, recordings, because what we're really trying to develop is not a checklist, so a parent gets you know, a checklist home. That may not mean as much as a whole narrative record and portfolio of the student's growth and development. Um, we uh, uh, have some programs that are aligned to our curriculum, but I did want to just let you know some of the, the kind of research we've done in best practice and our own values um, are everything we're doing, we're doing is rooted in um, constructivist practice. And that just means that we believe that children construct knowledge. They are not empty vessels that just receive knowledge. They're creating it. They're co-creators in the learning process. That's why we've chosen this curriculum, why we have an expectation that the learning that happens in these buildings is hands-on, it's experiential, it's center-based. Um, we're very intentional about the materials that are chosen. Um, we want them to be uh, independent and have self-directed learning. Um, we also have been intentional about the literature and materials um, that we are having in the classrooms and we want to make sure they're multicultural. They need to reflect diverse cultures and most importantly, the children need to see themselves in these schools. So the books that they see in their classrooms need to be reflective of their culture, their language, and their backgrounds. Um, we are also uh, continuing to develop the school schedules but they, uh, the root of all of this is that it's developmentally appropriate, meaning there's time for rest, there's time for outdoor play, um, there's ample time for gross motor. Um, we, we want to make sure that we minimize transitions, the time that young children are in and out of their classrooms in the hallways, um, and we want to minimize whole group instruction, use it very effectively. But again, when you walk into our classrooms, you should see our children so busy and active and engaged that it's hard to get their attention because they're so happy and busy. Um, we have, I mentioned the partnership with Plant the Seed, and I think we even have some of our partners here. Um, they uh, are a nonprofit organization that um, partners with schools um, to do garden-based service learning and um, project-based learning. And so they are um, hard at work with us and the directors um, developing plans to have school community gardens that will be a part of the curriculum and learning, but will also be intended to be shared with the parents and community. Um, and really, we really want to invite the community in um, to develop this with us. So we've got some, some great plans in the work there. Um, we have a partnership with the uh, Global Education Center, um, and specifically this is for Casa Asafran, um, to, uh, they have a, a, a fabulous dance studio that our kids are gonna be able to use each day. And they do some wonderful multicultural music and movement programming. Um, so we're, we're very excited about that. And then we are developing for Ross and Bordeaux uh, uh, arts programs. We have a music teacher that we've recruited um, from Blair School of Music who is developing the curriculum with our directors specifically for the centers. And we're looking at um, uh, Reggio Emilia art programs. We really wanna incorporate a, a music and art component. And our thinking here again is, um, you know, we are serving a lot of students that may not have access and opportunities to these kinds of enriching programs, and they deserve it just as much as any other student or child does. And so we want to bring it to them, and we're going to bring it to them in these centers. Um, the last uh, component of a very strong program um, is those kind of strong home school connections. So um, we believe that 
um, in terms of standards and benchmarking best practice, we need to have a purpose for our family engagement. And for us, our purpose is to empower families through knowledge. This is the first time that we have an opportunity to really engage families that are coming into our district. And so we want to empower them to understand the school system and how to navigate it. I think that's particularly important for a lot of our uh, immigrant families. Um, it can be overwhelming trying to interact with a school system this size. Um, we want to empower them to understand what we're doing and why and what they can do at home. And we want them to know and have access to resources and supports that are available in the community. Um, we're going to have a family engagement specialist that specifically is dedicated to Ross and Bordeaux. Um, we have a, uh, a Parents as Partners program for Casa Asafran that will be run by a family engagement coordinator and um, they have a specific pre-K curriculum. Um, we believe that's especially important um, as, as many of those families are um, speak English as a second language and um, are, have challenges in understanding how to navigate the school system. We're gonna have family resource libraries at each center and we're looking to partner with the uh, Nashville Public Library to help us resource those. Um, and we believe uh, that families should have multiple ways to engage in uh, the life of the school, not just one way. And, um, and we intend to uh, leverage the parent talents and build on their home cultures because we believe that the diversity is an asset for us. Um, in terms of assessing uh, and, f and learning what works, we are partnering with Vanderbilt, the Peabody Research Institute. Um, we're really excited about this partnership. They have really helped us with the design of the programs. And what they're going to be doing is a, a two-part assessment this year. Um, they will be doing a, a pre and post assessment for every child in the center. Um, and, and that is an assessment that will be done at the beginning of the year and then at the end of the year. And again, it is done uh, with metrics around these developmental domains that you see here. Um, so we'll be looking at language and literacy and um, quantitative skills and applied reasoning um, and social emotional development as well. And when we say assessment, um, I want to be very clear that this is not kids sitting down with paper and pencil. This is not multiple choice. This is 20 minutes max at a time, and they are all games and interactive play. So you, the children don't even know that they're, that they're being assessed. Um, and we'll have an assessment team that works closely with our teachers on that. The part that we're really excited about, um, and that's unique to what we're doing, and it's unique in the country right now, um, is uh, something called a narrative record. We have uh, an assessment team from Vanderbilt that will be coming to do observations in our classrooms three times a year. Um, they will arrive before the students get there and stay until after the students leave. And they're going to be looking at a number of things. They're going to be looking at specifically um, the, how the time is spent in the classroom, episodes of time. They're going to be look, have, collecting a running account and description of everything that's happening in the classroom. They're going to be looking at the content of instruction, the level of instruction, how much time is spent on math, how much time is spent in certain content areas. They have some specific coding that, where they look at behavior management, what kinds of conversations the teacher has with the students, what kinds of conversations the students have with each other. Um, they even have some other kind of coding for uh, the physical environment and the way the students are interacting with the materials. So they will essentially be tracking everything that's happening in these classrooms. Um, they take that back and do some pretty sophisticated analysis for us and then provide, come back to the school uh, a month later and sit down with the teachers and the staff and provide this feedback and data to them. Um, teachers will get to see their own classroom data. Um, the teachers together will look at their school data. And the purpose of this is to create a built-in continuous improvement model where the teachers look at this data and then the teachers and the coaches and directors make decisions about how to improve the program. And we really learn what works. And that's the point of, of having these centers in the first place. So this is not an assessment to say, we know what the model program is. We're going to implement it and did it work. This is what works. We're going to really learn as we go um, and have this be teacher-led. 
So just very quickly, I want to share with you some numbers. Not only are we focusing on the creating the environment and the curriculum and instruction and staffing these centers, we're also focusing on enrolling students into these centers. So uh, since January, the pre-K department has been working very closely with student assignment and data quality to implement the very first lottery process for pre-K that we've ever had in our system. And I can say as of today, we've had over 2,500 families to submit applications district-wide for uh, pre-K programs. And tonight I'm sharing with you what we have so far in our uh, pre-K centers, uh, the enrollment numbers at, uh, to date. But we continue to get applications every day, so these numbers change. Uh, constantly. Right now uh, at Ross with the 13 pre-k classrooms we have the ability to serve 248 students and our current enrollment now uh, and we're still waiting for acceptance of these uh, offers. We are at 129. At Bordeaux with 10 pre-k classrooms serving uh, 192 students and this is gen ed and uh, exceptional ed students with IEPs. Uh, we, our current enrollment is at 99, and at Casa Azafran, with the four pre-K classrooms, we can serve up to 80 students, and current enrollment offers are up to are, are now at 80. Uh, we are working very care closely with the directors and have created an aggressive uh, um, recruiting campaign to uh, focus on families that remain on the waiting list to uh, contact them personally to uh, offer seats at each of these uh, sites. We're also looking at uh, attending enrollment fairs and creating flyers to uh, distribute in the neighborhoods and close na in, uh, neighborhoods that are in close proximity to each of these sites and to also, I think we were talking about uh, distributing to churches as well. Uh, so. We do have an aggressive uh, campaign going on to continue that. And for any families that may be watching tonight, we wanted to just uh, show on the screen what they can do to register for pre-K. And you can go to any of our pre-K, any school site that contains a pre-K program and register uh, for any of our uh, programs, including the three hubs. And these are some of the materials that we ask families to bring, uh, the birth certificates and current immunization and physical, and the proof of residency along with proof of income. And, and so um, uh, our, our next steps um, are obviously to have a successful opening and launch of our early learning centers. Um, Ross and Bordeaux is scheduled to open in, in August in Casa Asafran in September. Um, and uh, in addition, again, this is part of a larger expansion plan. So our next steps um, in terms of the larger plan include um, really focusing on partnerships for citywide expansion. We now have a lot of data um, from this year's application cycle, so we can identify uh, locations in areas of greatest need, which is South Nashville and the periphery of the county. Um, so we're really looking at um, uh, uh, places to locate other than schools. Our schools are busting at the seams, and so um, we're, we're looking strategically uh, at different locations. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of co-locating services and programs, potentially with a partner like Head Start. Um, we would like to do that in the future. Um, and we are really going to need support to sustain this. So we are um, doing some research on other places that have done this well, um, that have some good blended funding models that we can, we can learn from in terms of future expansion. And we're going to have to shift quickly into um, advocacy to really expand and, um, and, and possibly even push the state to support this because it's going to be hard to scale and sustain this program without that, that kind of support from the state and federal government. And so with that, um, yes, uh, I wanted to um, uh, introduce our directors and give them each a minute um, to give you a sense of their background and what they're bringing to our endeavor. So I will start with the new director of Ross Early Learning Center, um, Laura Bilbrey. Good evening. My name is Laura Bilbrey, and um, 
I just wanted to start by really say, offering you a sincere thank you. Um, your leadership, your innovation, your forward thinking is really making this possible as a board and Dr. Register as the director of schools. Um, Nashville has an opportunity to be a pioneer in early learning. There aren't many cities that are really recognizing the value of helping children and families have a really strong start from the beginning. And so I'm really proud to be a part of this. I come to the director role at Ross with over 25 years of experience in early learning. Uh, a, a large portion of that was spent with a private provider. Um, I've been a teacher, a recruiter, an administrator, um, overseen multiple sites, and part of my career was spent, 10 years of my career was spent in Europe. Um, and, and while there, I had the opportunity to look at many different international models, and it's just incredibly inspiring to look at different municipalities and nations, universities, whatever that, that was really doing some innovative approaches to early learning that were developmentally appropriate. It wasn't taking um, pedagogy that was appropriate for 10-year-olds and, and somehow watering it down for 4-year-olds. They were really doing it in an appropriate way. <clears throat> but understanding the priorities in, in our own country, when I came back to America, I was, I kind of thought that period was over. I thought, um, you know, when it, when it came to municipal approaches to early learning that we weren't, we weren't there yet and was only home for just less than two years and then this opportunity came about and I, I really am incredibly proud to be a part of that. Um, I've spent a lot of my career working on family engagement um, and, and have a really strong commitment to serving families who are living in poverty or some of the more marginalized citizens in our community and um, have no doubt that this is going to be the highest quality early learning program, our three. Um, but we really are committed to taking it beyond that, to sharing all of that richness and knowledge building with Phyllis and all of the community uh, site-based um, principals and teachers and making sure that every child in Nashville, not just those who are fortunate enough to, to be selected through the lottery, has an opportunity to have a world-class um, start to their education, work closely with principals and kindergarten teachers to make sure those transitions go incredibly well. And, um, just hope everybody's ready for the, the, the terribly empowered and involved families that will be in kindergarten starting next school year. So thank you very much. Thank you. To get a sense of why we're so excited. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dana Ekman, who is the new director at Bordeaux Early Learning Center. Well, good evening, everyone. I just want to echo, Laura, the gratitude for the vision you have. Do I need to bend over or am I okay? Okay. <laughs> You're good. Uh, I come to you from California. I uh, started there and then I moved to, to Georgia where I began working in pre-K. Just a little bit about my background. I know I don't have a lot of time, but uh, I just want to share with you, I started off in the field of social work and uh, loving my, my work with families, work with Child Protective Services. I decided to go back and get into the education field and uh, start teaching at the high school level with single subject, coaching and teaching. And uh, then as, when I moved to Georgia, I just I took a job with pre-K and fell in love with it. I realized at that time that I can impact a child from birth to five and I can impact the whole child and the family to help support them to get a fresh start, a successful start into K-12 in the very beginning. So I've stayed in that field and I will always stay in that field because that's where my passion is at. And I, um, I just want to say, I, I don't want to go into too much background. I hope I get to know each of you. Please come to the site. We'll be up and running August. Right? Up and running August. <laughs> yes, we will. And um, again, I thank you for your vision. I thank you for your dedication, your commitment to children. And I know this is going to impact families in Bordeaux community as well as all of um, Davidson County. So thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to uh, introduce Joanna Guerrero, who is our new director at Casa Asafran Early Learning Center. Um, good evening. My name is Joanna Guerrero, and I just want to thank you for your time today in advance. Um, I am originally from Texas. In Texas, I spent the majority of my time working with bilingual ESL and dual language programs, uh, mainly from pre-K through fifth grade. Um, we started, it, this was in Louisville, Texas, and we actually started with um, one-way dual language programs where we targeted mainly Spanish-speaking students because that was our largest population. 
and we knew that dual language programs were really the best programs for closing the achievement gap between um, English learners and native English speakers. So we started there and the program was really successful. So um, I spent about nine years of my career in Texas and the year that I was leaving because my husband was being relocated um, to Las Vegas for his job, we actually started intense training and professional development to move from three dual language schools to nine dual language schools, three of which would continue with um, dual language programs for Spanish speakers, and then three new schools, which would be for Spanish speakers blended with native English speakers, so a two-way program. So the programs were really a huge success. Everybody really wanted to get in those programs, especially um, for the two-way because the students could only start in pre-K, kinder, and first, and they couldn't start after that. So that was a huge success. Um, when I left, we also began conversations to continue dual language programs up until the students graduated from high school so they could graduate with a dual language stamp on their diploma. And now those students are in ninth grade and obviously the programs are going really well because they will continue and graduate with that dual language stamp. So it was really good to be there and set the foundation for that. Um, I also worked with high school students in Las Vegas, Nevada um, through a bridge program called Upward Bound. So some of you might know about Upward Bound. Um, but it was a really great experience for me because it really brought to light the importance of early intervention and early learning for students. So jumping from elementary all the way to high school and seeing what could have been prevented as much as possible just really was a great experience for me and I was able to be a part of that as well. My husband and I moved to Nashville um, at the end of July last year, this past year actually, um, and we plan to be here a lot longer thankfully. Um, and I worked at Hattie Cotton as their STEM instructional designer, so I worked with teachers in all grade levels, pre-K through fourth, to help them implement STEM-based lessons through project-based learning, which is perfect because we'll be doing this at these centers as well. So that experience is going to be really valuable. Um, and then I, continue, I wanted to continue at Hattie Cotton until I heard about the pre-K expansion here in Metro schools and I knew I immediately wanted to be a part of that. I'm really passionate about providing early education to students but my passion quadrupled when I heard about Casa Asafran because the majority of the students there are going to be English learners and I myself am an English learner and I had the opportunity to go to pre-K. Um, I did so well in pre-K. I was in a bilingual class so I had Spanish and English instruction but when I went to kindergarten, I was in an all English class because I had such a good experience and a good program in pre-K that I was able to function in an all English classroom academically just as well as the other students who were native English speakers. So that's, that really touched my heart and I thought immediately, now I know I really want to be a part of this. And so I'm just really glad to be here. Um, I also am a third, generation, a third generation from an immigrant family and so I understand what it's like when there's language barriers and just bringing those parents in to be a part of the center is going to be a huge goal. Um, working with the English Learner Department will be really important for this center, um, but I'm just really looking forward to that and welcoming the parents and letting them know that they too are a part of their child's education and just building that collaboration will be really important. So thank you so much for your time. And I think we have a few questions um, around the board, around the table, but I want to start with a couple, if you don't mind, and then we'll open it up to the board members. Um, so Casa Asafran is not opening till September. So where are the children who are enrolled going to be between August and September? Um, we are um, uh, currently looking at that plan right now. In fact, we had been planning on um, opening Casa Asafran September 2nd, so there really wouldn't be that much of a delay. Um, but now, um, you know, we just uh, found out yesterday that it's going to be open a little bit later, and that's mainly just due to construction delays. So um, we're exploring some possibilities now um, and looking at options of, of how we can support those students and families and get them into a program on time so they're not losing too much of that pre-K experience, uh, minimize the transitions for them, and accommodate families um, both with and without transportation. So we've had some discussions with the transportation department, um, with other schools in the area. Um, we do have space um, at our other centers, so we're looking at the possibility of, of, of maybe having those children start with their peers at another center and then transition over to Casa Asafran when it's open. Okay. 
Could you give us an update on that when you have um, a more solid plan? Because that, that kind of concerns me that we get a month into having them in one location and then move them to another. Um, and another thing is that the community center in Hickory Hollow is well underway. And so there'll be this little library sitting all by itself empty right in the heart of Southeast Nashville. Just throwing it on the table that that'd be a prime location for a new pre-K hub. I'm just throwing it out there. So um, we'll start with you, Ms. Spearing. Dr. Brennan, did you have any? Ms. Spearing? Yes, thank you. And then we'll come over to you, Ms. Thank Shepard. You. Fabulous presentation, Lisa and Phyllis. Thank you so much. I feel like um, I, I, you guys are on fire, and I, I think everybody on this board feels the same way. Um, <clears throat> Not only is, do I commend this board for passing this and Dr. Register, but I also want to give special appreciation to Will because it was his brainchild in a lot of ways. It wasn't? Okay, I thought it was. No, okay. No. Oh, okay. Okay. This is all Dr. This is wonderful. And I think that we will see such a tremendous gain uh, I don't know if is there a way that we could do a study where we look at kids who have pre-K and compare them to kids who have not had pre-K and, and look at them over 12 years and see you know, what the results are. I think that would be a phenomenal study. Um, Yes, we're actually in discussions. Um, this week, uh, we were invited, or I should say we, Vanderbilt was invited um, to uh, apply for a grant um, that we have heard we have a pretty good shot at getting that would look at a long-term multi-year partnership with the school district and Vanderbilt um, to actually do some long-term longitudinal study of pre-K and do some really interesting comparisons. So we're going we're gonna to go for that aggressively. That's great. A couple of questions. Um, you said that there are um, there'll be some classrooms that have an apprentice and a lead teacher. About what percentage of the pre-K classrooms will will have that makeup? It will be a small number of classrooms this year, um, just mainly because of budget. Um, uh, but it will be approximately six classrooms of the 27 will have that. We're going to start small and see how that goes. But um, our intention would be to to, to kind of develop that. Um, model and then grow that going forward. So our ratio is uh, two adults, if not two teachers, a teacher and an aide, is that right? Yes, two. the ratio would be the same, two to 20. To 20, okay, I thought it was 15, okay. The other question is about the narrative assessment. Um, is that, will that take place in all of our pre-K classrooms with Vanderbilt or is that just in a selected few? No, that narrative assessment is just going to take place in the 27 classrooms in the model sites. Right. Um, uh, it is um, a, a rather expensive undertaking to um, to recruit and train um, the assessment teams and to the provide that much time. Um, but that's something that we can potentially work into a longer term partnership is to start thinking about how to get that kind of information in other pre-K classrooms. And, and when will you guys be ready for the board to come and visit? <laughs> oh, we're really excited about that. Um, uh, no pressure. <laughs> have a, we would like to have, we've had conversations about um, a kind of formal after the start of the school year, um, kind of ribbon cutting where you could come out and tour. And we welcome you in the centers. We just can't wait to get you in there. I think, I think my prediction is that the people that come to visit the centers will want to stay. And we hope that you'll want to come and be reading partners with our students and we'll just it, it's going to be really neat places to be. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, both of you, and thank you, Dr. Register. Ms. Shepard? Well, the, the presentation was wonderful. All I can say is wow, and thank you to everyone that made this happen. I know it, it was an incredible amount of work and dedication, so I do appreciate that. So the centers will have 520 students, right? The, the three hubs will. And so, uh, do you have an approximate number as to how many um, seats are in the in site-based classrooms? So, <clears throat> so the, oh gosh, I was going to say uh, 2,516, but the, in addition to 300 seats uh, okay. that we've added. So yes. So in your in your application process for these hubs, you, you mentioned this that you had you know a lot of applications so what is your feel for what the uh, what, how many seats are truly needed and will we ever get there yeah uh, 
We are there in, a, in probably 95% of our sites are full to capacity, um, right. meaning that, uh, especially in the Antioch area, uh, and we are forming waiting lists, which is the um, contact that the directors will begin having, uh, contacting families on those waiting lists to let them know that uh, the centers have the vacancies and that uh, they can apply there. But um, I can say that we do have some vacancies in certain schools that have traditionally uh, had openings at this time of the year. A lot of families wait until maybe a week before school starts or maybe even the day of in some, in some of our locations. And uh, we find that in a lot of our locations in East Nashville. So we kind of save a, a few seats knowing that we're going to have some families coming in very close to the start of the year. Well, I know I, the waiting list is the part that concerns me because I know that there is um, there are people that, that can't get in and who are keenly interested in doing that. So that my goal is that we never have those anymore. Yes, <laughs> that is our goal too. Again, there's this little place out in uh, <laughs> southeast Nashville, <laughs> Mr. Pinkston. I think uh, Ms. Shepard asked asked the key question. I didn't hear the answer. We might not have the answer yet, but how many seats do we need to add to get to universal pre-K in the community, meaning every family that wants or needs a seat gets one? What, what does that look like, and how many years does that take, and do we need to start now uh, having conversations with, with the council and the mayoral candidates about um, making you know this initiative uh, their initiative if they're willing to take it? Yes, absolutely. And um, I have a, we hired a research associate this summer who has been um, uh, taking a deep dive into the child find numbers, including all of the students who are currently served uh, by private providers. And the private provider world is large and expansive and really hard to get to those numbers. Um, but we're a lot closer than we were. Um, and we've got an issue of, of, of uh, you know, we don't know the number, but it's probably close to 2,000 students that need pre-K. We also have a great deal, uh, a number of students um, who are being served um, in, in centers with inconsistent quality. So it's a kind of two-part focus to really look at, again zero in on quality and seats um, so we'll we'll have a much clearer picture of that soon and then we can really start that that advocacy effort yeah I know you're trying to open centers and that's where the focus is but you know if we could sometime you know before the spring you know kind of get a bigger understanding and have a you know bigger community conversation about it I think the the odds of new investment in the in the out years is going to increase dramatically if we can advance that conversation next year. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's exciting. Any other comments, board members? You guys rock. <laughs> Thank you. Best saying. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank Again, I will echo whatever uh, other board members have said. You've done a fantastic job. We are very happy to have you two on board. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Madam Chair, that, that uh, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Fantastic. Um, and looky, 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 we have come to the end of our um, agenda for this evening. And in the absence of um, Ms. Frobe tonight, I will look at the table if no one has any other uh, business. This meeting is adjourned. All right.